Right, let me just get things running. Tea's ready. Tea is served. Pour more, anyhow. My daughter bought me a new uh, mug for my birthday. A bit better than the daddy one, I reckon. A bit more cred. And the audio is good. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, let me just let everyone on the um, on Discord know. Have some here. How is everyone? Good, I hope. Bit of a busy week. Oh, I was so busy this afternoon trying to finish something off on this design, finish the routing because I had so, added something last minute that I nearly forgot to stream. How bad is that? Well, it's not that I nearly forgot to stream, it's nearly forgot to make dinner, which I had to do before stream or make supper. Everybody would have been gone very hungry. But luckily I did, just in time. But it meant rushing around a bit at the last minute. <clears throat> right. Um, so what I want to talk about today is um, everything's now rooted. Um, for black ice, the new black ice. And uh, I was just going to go through, uh, I don't think there's any major changes with this stuff, but I just want to go through, there's actually two versions as well um, that I'm going to offer. Um, so I need to do something on how we name that, but we'll, we'll work that out. Um, so the ICE Logic Bus, that board hasn't changed, that's the one that you see here. I don't think any of this is any different to uh, what we saw last time, maybe slightly more polished. Uh, the silk screen's probably a little bit better. Although, because I've imported it in KiCad here, things were a little bit wonky on the silk screen, I notice. Uh, it does look a bit better on the uh, ice version. But, um, yeah, I don't think there's any major changes with this part. Uh, it's really more cleaning up than anything. Um, I was trying to think if I changed anything major. I don't think I did. Um, so let's look at the next one. So um, let's look at Black Ice NXT or Next. Um, hold on. Where's my. Here we go. Import. So obviously that's the lower layer. The uh, or the, that's the mid plane, if you like. So that on the on the bottom of that, the um, tiles go, and then on top of that goes the controller board. So let's open the Black Ice NXT controller board. Um, I need to import it. Hold on. Better find it as well. Hopefully, it copied across. I had a problem with copying these across earlier. Well, I can see what happened to some of those. Went to totally the wrong place. Um, so we've got the um, kind of the uh, original one, if you like. Um, hold on. Let's tell it where to put this.
<clears throat> so, um, this is the uh, Black Ice next. Um, there has been a few more changes on this. This is the Hyperbus version. Put a bit more light on here, actually. Must have met it. Um, so uh, it's now completely rooted and uh, finished. I need to explain a few things on here that probably have changed. Um, let's just do a quick run around this. Um, so on this version, the things to note here are um, that it's not showing for some reason. So let's just fix that, apologies. There you go. So that's the entire board in its entirety. That's the control it sits on top. Um, quick tour, so we've got the SD card, the MMC SD card here. We have the normal programming USB slash virtual COM port. Then we have the programming port here, debug port for the SDM32. And then we have the USB for power delivery here um, with the power delivery controller. And that delivers uh, the uh, higher voltages to the um, tiles or programmable voltage to the tiles up to 20 volts. Um, the mode switch here is um, it can be used as DFU, so when you're starting up, you can put it into DFU mode, just like it was on Black Ice, really. That's that's not changed. Um, we can also have a mode when we're going along, so we can have a backward compatible mode that makes it like the Black Ice, if we wish. And um, we've got the Hyper ROM and the Hyper RAM chips here. Um, which is why this is the Hyperbus version. And in addition, we have these two connectors, these jacks down here, both have serial ports on. But they can be used as uh, general purpose GPIO as well. Um, and just so you know how this is configured. So what you're looking at is the underside of that board. So that will be this, that, that will be face down above the ILB. The ice logic bus um, so these two will be poking out on the aperture above whatever is in the um, on the tile which is directly below it or indirectly below it you know via the mid plane for some distance so the, i tell you what these are good for is if you want to use remember when we were looking at those keyboards um, you can get like the double keyboards that have uh, two jacks on them. Well, those are serial jacks, basically. So you could plug two of those in and then run the Rust firmware for those keyboards, which already exists, which I'm looking at porting. Um, so that gives us easy access to plugging those kind of keyboards in. We can then do the translation uh, into key codes on the uh, STM32. Um, or we can do a special keyboard which is just the, any of those normal keyboards, but what we do is we just pipe it up the uh, UART jack rather than the USB jack, again into a one or t'other of these connectors. Um, so it just depends whether we've got a, you know a modified single board keyboard or one of those double double ones. Um, let me just reply to this. Very rude of me on there. Just handshaking with my daughter. Make sure she's got back all right. Um, so that's what those two are there. And it's just, I've, I've added those in because it's um, relatively low overhead way of adding that kind of keyboard support. 
You could alternatively bit, back, bit bang PS2 very easily using the GPIO pins as well, which is another possibility if you wanted to do that, using those same IO pins. Um, anything else that's changed on here? I think it's just fully rooted uh, where it wasn't before. We've got the flash in the top. Um, sorry, those are the jacks I was talking about because my pointer wasn't showing up. And then we've got uh, the built-in flash for the images here, which is attached to the STM32. And then the STM32 has QSP I connections down to, through the mezzanine connectors, onto the ILB bus. And then the memory is connected via the ILB as well. Then on the right-hand side, we've got all the P mods, um, one of which can be a full mix mod, or they can be individual P mods, depending on how how we populate them really. Um, I did swap the top and bottom middles on this. I did have the mix mod at the top originally. I've now got the mix mod at the bottom. Uh, these interfaces here are just I squared C and UART. Optional, can be populated. I just wanted to make sure our pins were covered. Uh, and then we've got the video connector at the top here that's more fully populated now. So that's based um, these aren't particularly standard, but there are some common ways of wiring them. I've chosen one, and we're going to have to test that and see how that goes, frankly, because um, until I test one, I don't know for sure um, how many others it might work with. But I, I, I'm working off one that I think is fairly standard on this 40-pin LCD connector. Um, so you have a 16-bit data bus. You have the... There's four control signals that go with that um, in terms of the output enable, write enable, um, register select and uh, chip select effectively, LCD select. And then this stuff here is for the backlighting. Um, Resistance for the backlighting. Again, I'm not sure exactly what the value is to there. It doesn't really say much about it, but we can change the values on that. And then I have a FET here, driving the anode for those uh, backlight LEDs. That, in turn, is connected to um, uh, a, back, a backlight line, uh, this one here. On the STM32. So we could actually uh, PWM that if we want to control brightness if we need to. So that was, I added that in. Um, what else have I put in? Um, not much really, a bit of optimization. I've moved a few pins around just to try and get, you know, shortened distances, try and demangle it slightly. So less lines cross, etc. Just all the normal stuff. I don't think there's anything new um, here. I've got a jumper for the 2.5 volt, which can jump to 3 volt. You can do that either on the mezzanine, or you can do that on the um, on the ice logic board directly. That 2.5 volt we don't have a regulator for on the ice logic board now. Um, it's optional. That's just for when you're doing the kind of uh, one-time programming, which we don't use. But it's there as a jumper if we need to be able to do that. Um, and you just override the... Um, oh, what's happened on here? That's weird. Uh, and you, you can just override the voltage on that. At the moment, by default, that will get soldered via the jumper here uh, to 3 volt free, which is what you what you want to do when you're not using the uh, programming mode. Um, any, anything else on there? Any questions on that? Because I think we covered most of this last time. It's just finished off now. Um, I don't think there's anything else on there that I've added. It's just really shuffling things around. Okay, so the next one, 
So I thought that's cool, but we need the next. Uh, there's another option that I wanted to do for the black ice. Um, so even though it will use a common uh, ice logic board, sorry, ice logic bus board, uh, the black ice M NXT or next that goes on top of it comes in two flavors. So there's this flavor, which is hyperbus based. There's also a second flavor. So let me show you that now as well, because this is interesting. Um, let me let me find. The import. Uh, I think it's this one. It closes this every time. Hold on, let me reopen it. Okay, so this is the other um, Black Ice NXT board, but this has a slightly different uh, population to it. Um, slightly different arrangement. In fact, this isn't the latest version. Hold on, let me double check. Bear with me a sec, folks. Let me just check that I've opened the right thing. Because, unless I didn't save the um, Bear with me just a sec, let me just double check something here. Just copy it over again because for some reason that didn't. Um Hold on, it's reopening it. Doing something very strange here. Save 
save the import. That's better. I don't know how it managed to get the old one. Maybe the copy wasn't good. Right, so a uh, few differences. So uh, one of the things we've got that's different here is the memory. Here we're using QSPY flash and QSPY RAM. Um, the flash is slightly smaller because it's uh, it's a uh, 32 megabit. So four megabyte QSPY flash. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's uh, 64 megabit QSPY RAM and that's 8 megabytes effectively. This of course uses less pin than the, less pins than the hyper, hyper bus. Reason for doing this is very simple. Um, is to be able to offer a slightly lower cost version that has slightly lower memory performance. I mean, it's QSPY rather than Hyperbus. Secondly, the extra pins I use to add in, if you look here, what I've got is an ESP32 C3 mini module uh, on the rear of this board or what would be the top of the stack um, and the reason for having that is I can then run um, that I've then got Bluetooth and I've got Wi-Fi connected the two and this is an option you can have it with or without that build with or without uh, and also it can run MicroPython or um, CircuitPython because the C3 Mini can run either of those. Um, so it's kind of nice. So you can script it with Python as well, do some Python orchestration. So everything else is fairly similar. Um, the USB I've moved down here for the power delivery. And then the button arrangement is slightly different um, because this button now ref is for resetting the um, uh, the ESP32 module um, and the way that the LEDs wired gives one pin so it can be blinked from the ESP32 as well. In addition I've had to move the uh, debug the STM32 up to the top here adjacent to this aperture so you can still get to it as well as the um, DFU button and mode button. Uh, the other thing, I've taken away one of the jacks because I'm using one of the TX ports to talk directly between the STM32 and the ESP32. Um, there's another pin here which is to do with programming the ESP32. So I can boot it up in its programming mode. And the USB from the ESP32 C3 goes to the power delivery USB. So you can use that. But you only need that really when you're programming it. Otherwise, everything can be done through, um, you know, the um, either over Bluetooth because it's if you're running circuit Python, it supports Bluetooth transfer and stuff, or you can talk to it via the um, virtual com port as well. Um, it also the extra pins that are left over, uh, which we have uh, six of them left over um, because we've gone down from Hyperbus to quad spy for the memory means that we can get a QSPI connection into the FPGA itself from the USB32 as well. So we get the best of both worlds. How are we going to use that depends. We can already use it, use the spy in a normal transfer mode. Um, if we are using the, if we want to use a quad spy, then what we do is we have to memory map part of the memory uh, inside the FPGA. Uh, is probably the uh, easiest way of doing it. Um, so it's going to be fun experimenting with that. I mean, basically what I'm doing here is I'm taking the stuff we did with Alloy 
if you remember that, the alloy board, which was a combination of the OP 5K and an ESP32. And I'm just applying that here uh, to the black ice. But obviously we're talking about the uh, ice 40 HX, which is quite a bit more powerful, uh, pinout wise, etc. So this is the other alternative. So what we will probably, what it will probably look like is when you go on to say Tindy, if you wanted to buy this, you would have a choice of three different uh, controller board options. You'd have the quad spy memory, uh, the basic option. Uh, you'd have the hyperbus option with faster, greater memory. And then you'd have the quad spy with Wi-Fi option. So you can choose from three different types, depending on how you want to use it, really. Um, so that's the idea behind it. So let me know your thoughts on that, Laurie. Um, so that's what this other build is about here. Um, so it really just differs on the, you know, on the uh, west part of the board, you know, the east part, pretty much the same. Uh, it's mainly the west part or the lower west part, mid to lower west part that's changed. And the memory configuration. What do you think, Noi? Still got the keyboard port here, or you are stroke keyboard port. Um, I don't think anything else has changed apart from putting the debug at the top rather than down here because we didn't have room for it anymore. I think it's pretty much the same. Laurie says, excellent new option. Of course I want both. <laughs> I'm really not surprised because I'd have both as well, depending what I was working on as to which would be the most advantageous. Um, I think this is the fun one, if you like. The most interesting fun one. But not necessarily the most performant. You know, the Hyperbus one is definitely going to be much more performant memory bandwidth wise uh, and latency wise, obviously. But uh, yeah, uh, it was to me, it was just a simple change. Um, and I've sourced all the stuff. The only thing I haven't sourced is the uh, ESP32 minis, but they're in stock, plenty of in, plenty are in stock. So, um, yeah, I kind of like it. Um, so all these are now ready to go. They're all rooted, all, although one thing I haven't rooted yet is this little button here. So I want to check um, how you get into the programming mode on C3. I think it's using... Um, I09 being pulled down with this boot thing, but I haven't 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 put that link in yet. But that's easy to do. Um, I was just finishing that when I realised I need to get ready for um, supper and uh, the stream earlier tonight. It's the only thing I haven't linked in, but that's that's simple to do. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to playing around with this one in particular, particularly mixing in you know the uh, the Python and stuff as well. You know, porting the stuff I did with the alloy uh, and using Bluetooth and stuff. That's going to be cool. I mean, this is kind of good for the robotic stuff, really. You know, where you need the remote connection type thing. If you're doing like a mobile robot or something like that, then it's really useful to have the Bluetooth and or the Wi-Fi. Um, that, that's my thinking. It's, it's for those sort of applications, really, where you need that remote connection. Um, so that's the good news and these are all done they're all ready to go I am going to run some more checks over the weekend just to double check before ordering however the problem I've got at the moment is uh, Shenzhen is uh, in lockdown at the moment um, you can still order PCBs the trouble is they're not once they're built, they're not getting sent out. 
again it's a transport shipping issue that's what's failing under lockdown right now um, I'm trying to see if there's any other way around it but I think it may just be a case of having to be patient and waiting until we get the uh, these proto boards back but um, yeah just bad timing really I mean but you know I have looked at um, there's a European supplier called Isla that I really want to try but unfortunately I can't make the ice logic board through them because the specs for the ice logic board are higher than they're capable of doing um, I may be able to run the ice logic board through Osh Park that's a possibility I am playing around I may have to make some small changes to make it work but I don't know if it's worth doing it through Osh Park instead. Um, see, what I wanted to do is I was going to order actually 10. So what I was going to do, I was going to order 10 ice logic boards and then I was probably going to get uh, 10 of the black ice next and five of these newer ones with the Wi-Fi on. Um, and the prototype tile, which I should have shown you, actually. I might copy that over in a minute, just so you can have a look, just to be thorough. And these new version of the seven segment tile, I was gonna order that as well. <clears throat> and maybe if I finished the VGA tile, I've just got to make some small changes to that over the weekend then I could order that as well by the time you've added all that in it's pretty expensive even through you know JLC PCB JLC but to do it through uh, Osh Park holy crap uh, it was about three times the price um, I mean you know hundreds and hundreds of dollars literally to get the quantities that I wanted for the you know the dev team <sighs> so I'm stuck between the rock and a hard place um, I'm gonna have a little think over this weekend what to do but I'm, I'm tempted to just just wait for jail jail C to get their shit together basically with the shipping see the problem is even if I put them through Osh Park and I will have to change the boards to make make them work through Osh Park because the design rules are different um, there's some quirky things about the way that the USB routing through hole plated through hole um, uh, solder lugs are done that I know works with JLPCB but with Osh Park it probably wouldn't work first time and the trouble is so if I put it through Osh Park I still won't be certain that it's going to go through JLPCB properly you know so I won't be in a position afterwards to think oh I can now order you know 250 of these boards or 100 boards or whatever um, because I would have prototyped using a different vendor. Um, so I'm tempted to just stick with JLPCB. Trouble is I don't know when I'm going to get them. So it's just a heads up really to folk, but in all likelihood, it's going to take a good few weeks before we get these. And I hope that doesn't turn into months, quite frankly. But it's all a bit of an unknown with the lockdowns in China and Shenzhen. Got no control over it. So that's the status, anyhow. Just 
getting some sugar in my system now. But let me know your thoughts. I'm not particularly um, enamoured by it. It's hoping it will go a bit more smoothly. But I'm not alone. I've been talking to a bunch of other people about it. Everyone's in the same boat. Everyone's having problems getting the PCBs from China. There's no way around that I've worked out anyhow. We've just got to be a bit patient. But it will set us back a little bit more time than I expected. Which is a shame. That's the current status. I just hope no one's in a huge hurry <laughs> to get their boards because it's going to take a little while, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Right, tea's finished. Water time. And I haven't done much on the retro, by the way. Um, I'm just putting that off quite a bit at the moment. So I'm a bit unsure about its design. And with all the problems getting PCBs and stuff, I don't want another one on top of the ones I've got because I've got enough issues just sourcing this stuff. It is a bit frustrating though when the work's already done that it's going to be delayed because of supply constraints. I just hope the shipping doesn't back up. So if they've got problems getting stuff out of Shenzhen that may in turn affect the ports because they won't be filling the ships and if they don't fill the ships they might stop moving the ships if they stop moving the ships, we'll be into a big shipping problem. On top of all the other issues. Just one thing after another, I'm afraid, in electronics right now. The whole supply chain is, um, let's just say, um, tricky. <laughs> but I've never known anything quite like this. It's just one thing after the other. Well, might even be able to see through my glasses again now. Oh, still a bit left. I mean, I guess I can always do some software in the meantime, but it doesn't help anyone else because I wanted to get some more of these boards out to people. So that they can start uh, working on it. I'm sure you'd like yours, Laurie. I think. Mm, what are those marks on here? But please let me know if you have any questions on this new design. I wasn't. I didn't have anything else planned really it was just an update and the reason that I couldn't do the stream on Wednesday is because of these supply issues and I've just been fighting with it quite frankly trying to find a way around oh, it's got to be clean now some sort of mark. Is it on the inside or the outside? Oh, What's everyone else been up to? Anything interesting? Oh, I noticed that um, I think Goran shipped some ULX freeze. Apparently it was a bit of a a run on them at Mauser. 
i.e. they came into stock and went out of stock equally as quickly. Did you hear about that lorry? I don't know how many he built but yeah they kind of came and went really fast from what I um, what I heard. And I think he's got supply problems on certain chips as well. I think he put a request out for supply of one of them. I can't remember what it was. I don't think it was the FPGAs. I think it was... Was it the FTGI chip or something like that? Does it have an FTGI chip on it? I can't remember for programming it. Lois says Goran is getting the lippy camera working with ULX 4M. I did see a tweet on that, yeah. That's kind of cool. With the Raspberry Pi camera. Yeah. One of the ideas I was toying with Nori is you know we've got the ice logic bus board is doing an ECP5 version of that that works with these controllers certainly with the 12F so you, you could still possibly use you know the controller boards that you've already got as an upgrade path. The ULX 3S has a very cheap, not very good FTDI chip. What? Do you mean like a, a clone or something? I don't think FTD I do a cheap one. It's probably a clone. They do um, less capable ones, I suppose, but. Yeah, I think, I think that was the thing he was having problems getting hold of. The build. And yeah, what I was saying, so if I go back, so if we look at the ice logic board, what I'm thinking of doing next board wise, by the way, later in the year, maybe, I think I might be able to fit in um, Understand why I can't see that. Puts it in a really strange place. Let me just reload it. For some reason it won't pick it up. So you can imagine this, right? But instead of having the ice in the centre, you have a you know an ECP five twelve F. But it's going to be tight. 
Um, oh, FT two three one RS. I think that is an FTDI one. Yeah, so it is a proper one, but maybe it's the entry level one. Imaj uses it to do JTAG programming, which it wasn't designed to do. What by bit, bit banging GPIO ports on it, you mean? Yeah. They do a higher end one that has both JTAG and serial in separate ports. check that out actually um. Yeah, so it's an FTDI. Yeah, it's just a basic one, isn't it? What's the um? Hold on. Does that have a, like a? diagram so it has the serial port then it has these other pins yeah because the proper one for JTAG has a separate um, separate block for the JTAG and IOs but presumably somehow these are being bit banged I guess to be like JTAG Imar was forced to use it by the university against his wishes. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know, are these bit bang signals maybe? Maybe that's what she used. I think normally um, normally you get this kind of chip which has a UART and JTAG slash SPI um, high speed USB F 
T231. That's T231. That one. Yeah, because that's they only classify it as having a UART on there. It's not a dual port thing. According to this, it doesn't even have GPIO pins. You need to go up to a uh, one of these to get basic U GPIOs. Now, if you actually wanted their official JTAG supported ones, then you have to go up for something like this, I guess. So what's the price difference then? 232, what was it? 231, wasn't it? T231, was it XS? So that's $229, their nominal list price, versus, I guess if you went for a JTAG, yeah, you're looking at, you know, $4.50. But also this is much faster as well, has a faster USB, it's not just the extra interfaces. And is that built into the ULX3 then? Not plugged into the side. It's on the board. Oh, they used it on the previous ULX2S. Oh. Yeah, so what do they have on the ULX3 then? Something better. Let's have a look. Um, No, it's the same. It's the same FTDI chip though. Unless the ULX2 uses something different to that one. it says 500 kilobit JTAG and 3 megabit USB serial FT231XS two three one XS it doesn't say anything about JTAG on here So it must be doing some clever bit banging or something. And this is for uh, talking JTAG to the um, to the ECP five, right? Hmm. Anyhow, 
So I think I think I think it might have been the FCDI chip that he was having trouble with. I mean, I don't know what happens. Um, I mean, I don't use them. I stopped using the FTDI taps a long time ago. I haven't used it on a board for over a decade. Uh, RS have some in stock. They've got 88. I don't know how many he's after. might need more than that of course they're the only people that have got any apart from you know one of these companies that you probably wouldn't want to buy from what's the XSU hmm Interesting. Right. Oh, uh, this is one of the keyboards I was looking at. That reminds me. Remember I talked about, you know, one of these split keyboards. Each one has a jack. So the way that these keyboards work is you've got a microcontroller on each side of the keyboard. You have USB on each side, which you can program it. In this case, these are STM32072s, I think. Um, and one acts as a master, the other acts as a slave, depending on whether the USB is plugged into it or not. Um, but what you can do is you can kind of operate it in a UART mode. And what happens is the keys on this side are sent over the UART to this. And there's an event system. Um, so it can take those keys in as well as its own keys. So the mode I was thinking of operating in is having the, running the uh, main code on the STM32 and having these two as two jacks um you are as slaves um and this 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 is uh this is just one keyboard there are several but this is based around keyboard and keyboard is uh, a rust keyboard firmware so um it's fairly easy to use the keyboard library to do the keyboard stuff which is kind of cool so we could run that on the STM32 connect these two up to those jacks and um, take the uh, keyboard actions or events from the UARTs and process them using uh, keyboard on which is kind of cool and this Keyboard uses RTIC as well, so it's something we're familiar with. Um, there are quite a few different keyboards that support um, Keyboard, by the way. But I quite like these split ones, they're kind of nice. quite like some of the things that they've done with this one the most expensive thing when you're doing these keyboards are really the keys 
the switches and keycap combinations. Well, right now the PCBs as well because you can't order the damn things. But uh, yeah. So at some point I'll probably um, order the kit of parts to make one of these. Um, oh, it's keycad, so I'll probably redo it and I'll change the microcontroller because I don't have that microcontroller, but I have a another microcontroller I can use. Will be fun. Um, these are the guys that I want to offer um, offer our boards through. I mean, currently we use Tindy. Trouble is, Tindy doesn't handle stuff outside the United States very well. Um, certainly, they don't handle uh, the tax and stuff, the shipping tax if you're shipping to Europe. Whereas uh, electronics or electrons do handle all that, which is kind of cool. Um, it's much better for customers. So when it's ordered, you don't get the you don't get the you don't get whacked twice, you know, for both the customs and then the admin fees. Um, they support the um, is it what is it I O I O basically the online um, trading tax support, so that you can mark the product. Um, so I'm playing around with that at the moment they've only just extended support they've got beta support for people outside of Europe because we're in the UK unfortunately which is now out of Europe um, so they're only just enabling um, people outside of Europe to sell through their store and handle the tax um, the European stuff so that's going to be cool. So I, I, I've been looking at what I need to do to set this up as well. Um, when I get the board sort, you know, ordered, and I've got a bit more free time, I will complete the product pages and stuff for these. Um, start getting everything set up. Which will be nice. post now we're not actually thinking about um, an FTDI chip we were talking about ULX pre-S being briefly available at Mauser and then selling out very quickly and I think Goran announced he's missing chips to make some more and I think the chip he's missing is the FTDI chip which is why we were talking about it we were looking at which chip they were using I'm having some conversations around that um, as far as using FTDI goes, it is the devil's work. You know, I'm at least a decade free, FTDI free. You know, haven't used one in a long time. That was the original reason we put an STM32 on the MyStorm board, as it was originally called. To avoid, you know, to get off the FTDI stuff. You notice I've been eating candy again. You missed it, my post. Started early in the stream. My daughter bought me some lemon sherbet as a present. 
and they're highly addictive. Once you start eating them. And how are you, I post. I guess you missed the um, earlier part, so you probably don't know. Um, uh, you probably haven't seen the update. <laughs> you have to get back and watch it, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. All the rootings finished for black ice, but I didn't just stop there. I did two versions of black ice next. Uh, let me show you. So in addition to the black ice next that has the hyperbus ram and flash on it, um, there's also, uh, let's just get rid of this. And where did I put it? So on this version of the Black Ice Nexus, so this basically, um, when you order the uh, Black Ice, this you've got the mid plane, which is the Ice Logic bus, and the tiles attached underneath, and then on top you've got the controller board, which is the Black Ice board. So you've already seen the Hyperbus version of that, that has Hyperbus, Flash and RAM. Uh, the other option is this, which has not uh, Hyperbus, but Quad Spy, Q Spy, Flash, and RAM. Similar quantity, slightly less flash, half the flash, in fact. Um, and this, this is lower cost, slightly lower cost. But also, this one has the option, because we've got pins left over, we only use half the number of pins to do QSPI versus HyperFlash. The extra pins I use to connect to the ESP32, which you can see on the underside of this board here, which is the um, ESP32 C3 Mini, which is the RISC-5 version of the ESP32. Uh, and that gives us Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So that's an option. So that's like a third option. Um, uh, and that can run MicroPython or uh, CircuitPython. And the CircuitPython has uh, BLE support as well, which is kind of useful. So that's that, that's that's the new board. And all these are routed. I'm just doing some more checks this weekend. I'm happy with this because I've changed this one. This is obviously a slightly newer board. Uh, and then we're going to order. So that's what we were talking about earlier. Um, got it. Are the are the flash? Does it have execute in place? Um, well, it can do. Are you talking about from the soft core point of view? I mean that yeah you can do that ah, come back in twinkle from outside we're gonna say hello hello to the folks who've been finishing your suppers been outside I can smell you nice and fresh Go on then. Um, from the C3 perspective, 
Uh, the C3 has built in flash, so four megabits, four megabytes. Are you four megabytes? Gotta check. I forgot. Hold on. So this is the um, this is the module, the optional module, and it's got 384 kilobytes built-in ROM, 400 kilobytes of SRAM, 16 of that is cache, 16 KB, uh, 8 kilobytes of SRAM for the RTC, and it's got four megabytes of embedded flash. That was 32 megabit. Bluetooth LE, Bluetooth 5, Bluetooth mesh. And it's got all the Wi Fi stuff as well. Um, doesn't have a huge number of peripherals, but we're not bothered about that because it hooks into the FPGA for that. I don't know if this will tell us anything about XIP, but I'm pretty sure. It supports XIP through the um, through their uh, SDK, or you can run Python or whatever. That's the module. Actually really small. I'm going for the one with a PCB antenna. The reason I like this is one because it's risk five. Runs at 120 megahertz. Two is it's got Bluetooth as well as the um, Wi-Fi. If you go down the S2 route, you get Wi-Fi but not Bluetooth. Well, it provides Bluetooth connectivity as well as Wi-Fi connectivity. Last you can program it using um, even MicroPython or CircuitPython, both support the C3. Or you can program it in C, C using their SDK. I think they've got an Arduino SDK if you like that sort of thing. But yeah, being able to run the um, MicroPython on it's useful. But it's really for comms more than anything else. Um, so it has a UART link to the STM32, 
and it has six pins to the FPGA. Those six pins can either be used as SPI plus UART or it can be used as QSPI. However, to fully use a QSPI what you have to do is you have to memory map because it has a memory mode. Um, I think it goes up to something ridiculous like 120 megahertz, which is pretty good. Um, so in that mode, what you do is you'd make the FPGA look like a piece of memory. And then it would, um, you know, you could map in some of the memory, some of the uh, local FPGA um, embedded memory, for example, and use that as a FIFO or buffer or something like that. Or you could have it indirectly connect to the connected QSPI flash and um, RAM, although your latencies would go up if it has to go through the FPGA to get to that. But yeah, there, there are different things that you could do. But it's, re it's primarily for connectivity and or being able to script stuff in Python and hack stuff really and play around. But that's 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 the purpose of it. <sighs> but it, I mean, it's quite powerful. You know, you've got 120 megahertz RISC five on there. I mean, your your memory sub system for the FPGA is probably half the speed because it's QSPI rather than an uh, hyperbus. You know, if you want fast memory subsystem, then you go for the hyperbus board. Um, and if you want Wi-Fi with that, then you'd add a tile with Wi-Fi on it or something. Because it uses up all the pins, so you can't add the Wi-Fi on the mezzanine or on the controller board. Um, but if you go for the QSPI memory configuration, like the one I showed here, then you've got enough pins left over to do the um, connection to the uh, um, to the USB 32 as well. So you'd have to kind of weigh up, you know, for your particular application, which one was more suitable, really. Uh, yeah, there isn't actually much choice in terms of um, the, there's quite a few different flash chips. There's very few um, QSPI RAM chips that are available. Uh, I'm using the, um, the popular one, the Lion Tech or whatever it's called. Um, uh, you part number hold on. Uh, a few yeah. <sighs> um these are a bit like um Hang on. Uh, what is it? Uh, six, eight. Well, six, four, zero, zero, S, L, I, T, I think. These aren't what you might call generally available, but they're available in um, Asia, for example. 
Um, source mine from in the past. There we go, these. So there's 64 megabit serial PS RAM. Linear burst is supported up to 84 megahertz. Um, performance clock rate up to 144 megahertz. Oh yeah, so you can, if you don't cross the page boundary, you can hit it quite fast, quite hard and fast. Um, so if you know, if you're doing a burst within a page range, you can um, do success successive ac accesses at up to 144 megahertz, which speeds things up a bit. Otherwise, if you have to go, if you cross a page boundary and do it in an unburst uh, address or random access type fashion, then then you're gonna work at 84 megahertz or less. And that's a nibble each time. So you halve that to get, you know, megabytes per sec. So that translates to, you know, 42 megabytes per sec or um, 144, so 72. Um, I think it's, is it DDR or SDR? I think it might just be SDR. Let me just see. Did it have the... Um, features... Say on here. SDR mode. Do you do you have the um? Because it's a nibble of time, nibble per clock cycle. Um, and a page size is one uh, k basically. Um. Oh, I posted just um, posted a link for the because um, he's just um, done another. Um, he just started his new series, actually. Let me put that in the video channel here. Definitely watch this. <coughs> so, if you saw him build his processor before, uh, he's now doing the RISC V one. Relatively simple RISC V one, which is kind of cool. And he's got his first in the new series of that out. <coughs> Do check that out, folks. Yeah, that 144 megahertz speed is only when it's within the same page, if you're doing like a burst access, or a successive sequential access. So it's not bad. I mean, it's not the same as Hyper, Hyperbus, which is, you know, obviously operating at 8-bit and DDR. So it's kind of like working at 16-bit with the given clock rate. Keep in mind, this is for beginners, which excludes you. Oh, 
<laughs> I yeah, I wouldn't say that personally. But yeah, obviously Laurie's a bit more advanced than many of us. Right, yes. It's a very good series I post. Definitely watch these vids. Subscribe, hit the subscribe button. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you have any questions about the board. I mean, we did kind of go for it earlier, I post, but if, if you've got any questions, let me know. Uh, basically, it's very much the same as the standard NX, Black Ice NXT. It's just this lower quadrant is slightly different because it's got QSPI memory rather than Hyper RAM. It's got the uh, ESP32 module. The USB shoved down a little bit. Um, the, the, there's a few more buttons because you need to be able to reset the module. Um, and the debug for the STM32 is moved basically up here to the top. So this quadrant is different. Um, and yeah, the debug's moved up there. But the rest of it is the same as the other black eyes now. And I have stock of those chips as well. They can be difficult to get hold of. And they're certainly a lot more expensive now than they used to be. Considerably more. Right. Well, I wasn't going to do a long stream this evening. Um, the other thing I should mention for iPost's benefit, um, so even though the boards are rooted, I am doing a few more checks this weekend just to double check on this new one, some of the additions. But my problem here is not so much these being done and ready. The problem is in Shenzhen because they are locked down. Um, so they're still taking orders, they're still processing orders, they're taking a little bit longer to manufacture. But I think the big issue is coming to shipping because uh, everything's stacking up, um, you know, on the uh, factory output uh, with the couriers and the boats and everything else. And, because of all the lockdowns, there's this kind of knock-on effect. So I'm not sure when we're going to have these um, prototypes. I say prototypes, it's actually finished, but I mean, we need to debug them first. Make sure that uh, everything does what it ought. Um, but yeah, um, there's a good chance they will be longer rather than shorter in coming because of what's going on there uh, and it could well get worse rather than better uh, which is quite frankly a pain in the bottom you know we just get over one issue and then we get new ones it's just uh, But, you know, what can we do? And I did look at um, European sourcing, American sourcing. Um, and for a longer boards, I can get them. But it's tricky doing the Ice Logic bus, the ILB board. The specs on that are quite high. Uh, and even though some people can do it, Trouble is, once you do it for a different uh, manufacturer, 
it's not proof when you want to then order hundreds of the boards. You want to do your prototype through the same, same manufacturers so that you know it's going to work and you don't hit any new problems that you, um, you know, you trouble, you actually troubleshoot the manufacturing at the same time. If we just find some more neon gas from somewhere else. Yeah, well, we don't need that. That's the uh, chip manufacturers that use that. And I haven't heard any. I mean, I know I know there's issues. A lot of it can, comes from Ukraine. But I don't know, you know, what, uh, what stock they have of that, how much they backed up with what was already happening. So, yeah, but that will have a longer term impact impact on certain chip production. I don't know what the choices are, you know, whether there are multiple regions in the world that can supply that or not. Um, the issues I'm talking about are really to do with the lockdowns in China and in Shenzhen and places like that. That's what's messing us up right now and getting these PCBs is um, yeah the fact that everyone's in lockdown which disrupts the manufacturing but more importantly disrupts the um, uh, couriers and the shipping international shipping so it's a bloody nightmare really but anyhow consider yourself updated I post um i think i'm probably going to call it now unless there's any specific questions because it's been a long week and uh i need to unwind a bit i think uh, that's why i didn't um stream on wednesday by the way because of these uh, logistical issues and stuff that i'm dealing with but um, I do appreciate you joining me this evening. And apologies for not being able to do it Wednesday. I hope I've cleared things up a bit so that you know where we are. I mean, the design stuff's done. It's just, you know, physically getting the damn things made. So um, we will just have to have a little patience, I believe. Okay, so if there's no more questions, I'm gonna call it for the stream. Uh, I will stream again on Wednesday. Um, I'm obviously going to be down on Discord as well, so conversations can uh, continue there. Okie doke, folks. Ciao.